ado, I am going to turn the mic over to Catherine and Greg. All right, thank you, Weiwei. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to start by quickly clearing up a possible misunderstanding about our abstract and original title. We originally referred to open pedagogy and institutional research, but realized a little late that most people consider institutional research to be research about an institution like demographics and completion rates, but we uh, really meant research conducted at an institution. And so we changed the title to say student research. So just, just to be clear. Um, we hope that this will be a collaborative hour where we consider as a group some of the implications of open pedagogy with respect to undergraduate research in higher education. So we welcome thoughts, comments, questions throughout the webinar. Um, please feel free to add uh, questions to the Q&A and we'll answer them at the end or you can write in the chat at any time. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Bem, and in this slide, we're going to introduce ourselves. So real quick, I am also a librarian at Lake Washington Institute of Technology, but my primary role is the faculty library coordinator, um, which allows for some director level work, as well as some uh, general supervision and management throughout the library. I have been involved with open education since 2011, and I've been working at the college and with other colleges regarding open education and open licensing since 2013. And previously, before Lake Washington Institute of Technology, I worked at North Seattle College, and I worked at a variety of libraries and educational orgs within the country of Cambodia, which I hold dear to my heart and continue to um, focus on when it comes to uh, international work. Catherine, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, so I'm Catherine and I'm a faculty librarian as well. And I've worked at LW Tech for about two and a half years and continually work on open educational resources projects for the school. So mostly helping to transition numerous courses to be fully OER. And um, you can see who I've been spending lots of quality time with during the pandemic. Um, a younger, younger baby was born just in December, so it's been wonderful to watch him grow during this time. All right, today we'll start out by defining a few key terms related to open education in order to make sure everyone has a basic understanding of what we're talking about. Then we'll think about the benefits and challenges of open pedagogy. We'll share some examples of how we have implemented open pedagogy at Lake Washington. And then in the spirit of openness, we want to have time to hear your voice and thoughts about implementing open pedagogy. So we have a couple scenarios to talk through. And finally, we'll consider the future and next steps. Okay, the first term I want to be sure to define is open educational resources, which have grown in popularity over the last decade. So simply put, they are teaching, learning, and research resources that have been openly licensed really with the intent to share intellectual content or that reside in the public domain. So meaning that they have no copyright. So examples of OER include textbooks, streaming videos, assessment materials, software, but it can really be anything that's used to support knowledge acquisition. OER are usually characterized by the five R's, which means they can be retained. So you can make and own copies as well as reuse, redistribute, revise, and remix them. And you can see here a little graphic of OER where users are taking, using, and returning documents from a communal pile. So next, what are open licenses? In 2001, a nonprofit organization called Creative Commons was founded with the intention of expanding the availability of creative works that could be reused, revised, or remixed. They have released these six different kinds of licenses, which allow for certain kinds of use without having to ask for permission. 
I think it's important to make clear that the creator never gives up copyright over their work, but allows it to be used and in cases modified, um, again, without the trouble of having to ask for permission. So each type of license has slightly different requests of the user. All of them ask that you attribute the work by making clear who the original creator was. And they're in order here from least restrictive to most restrictive. So for the license at the top of the list, CCBY, all you have to do is give attribution and you're otherwise free to do those five R's, retain, reuse, redistribute, revise, and remix the creative work. For the next one down, CCBYSA, which means uh, share alike, you're allowed to modify the work, but the new work you create must be shared with the same license as the original. And then for um, CCBYND, no derivatives, you cannot make changes to the work, but you can retain, reuse, and redistribute it. And for CCBYNC, non-commercial, you can make, uh, you can make changes to the work as long as you do not sell the resulting work. So, and then the last two are combinations of the licenses I've already described. So if you choose to openly license your work, the Creative Commons website has a nice step-by-step -step process for choosing what license works best for you. Um, another option for the, the next slide is um, creating an OER attribution um, using the Open Washington website, which formats and links the information you insert. And it also gives you code that can be added to a website. So now we get to open pedagogy. So the term open pedagogy has been around longer than OER. It was first mentioned in 1979 by Claude Paquette, who outlined three sets of interconnected values that work to break down barriers in education or open doors, as the image shows. So these values are autonomy and interdependence, freedom and responsibility, and democracy and participation. With the more recent emergence of OER, open pedagogy has been reinvigorated with a new inflection. So in this way, open pedagogy takes the term open a step further to mean not just a legal definition of open license, but an open way of teaching. Open pedagogy asks, what is the effect when we make things openly licensed? And how can OER be used to advance teaching to be more empowering, collaborative, and just? I have found that people intentionally try not to define open pedagogy in order to keep it as this always evolving or ever changing idea. They try to leave it as open as possible, but I thought I should give you something more, sub more substantive. So here's a quote from Robin DeRosa and Rajiv Jangiani, who are powerhouses within open pedagogy. So they define open pedagogy as a site of praxis, a place where theories about learning, teaching, technology, and social justice enter into a conversation with each other and inform the development of educational practices and structures. And I think what's really at the heart of this definition is the word conversation. By teaching with open pedagogy, you are allowing everyone to share through speaking and listening, giving and taking. So one major way that people are acting on the principles of open pedagogy is by answering the problem of the disposable assignment. Disposable assignments are student assignments that are completed, graded, and then you never see them again. But renewable assignments somehow create value for the world beyond the student create, completing the assignment. So examples of this are asking students to write or edit Wikipedia articles, asking students to create learning objects such as videos, PowerPoint slides, diagrams, or questions for a test bank. And these materials should be particularly valuable because students will have a better understanding of the level of knowledge of other students. And um, also having students present or publish their research in a professional manner will make their work useful to other scholars. 
All right, benefits of open pedagogy and OER include that it allows for materials to be adapted if necessary to support accessibility to students of all abilities as well as universal design for learning. It also creates inclusive learning opportunities. And a couple weeks ago, Dr. Bergstaller explained all the benefits of this work wonderfully in the first webinar for this series, so I won't repeat that. Um, open pedagogy also reinforces students' personal identities and learning needs or goals and strengthens the student instructor relationship as students become colleagues in learning. And finally, the easiest way to sell students on it is to let them know that their course materials are free of charge, which removes some of the financial barriers to education and closes equity gaps. Okay, and then here are some challenges that we found in working with open pedagogy. First, it takes time to implement any new approach to teaching. Finding OER or deciding how to create reusable assignments will take planning. You will also have to spend time educating your students on open pedagogy and open licenses. Another challenge is that is the need for empathy. So when working with a diverse set of students, it's important to be aware of cultural differences that may affect learning. Instructors need to be ready to interact with students on a deeper level, putting student identities and experiences first. In addition, instructors must understand that some students may feel threatened by being asked to share their personal work, and it's important to give alternatives to, for assignments. And this is related to students who may be uncomfortable with non-standard teaching methods. The worst possibility is that open pedagogy may have the opposite effect and exacerbate inequalities, such as if a student is asked to use an online textbook but doesn't have Wi-Fi at home. All right, so um, I'm gonna pass it over to Greg soon, but I wanted to see if there are any questions first that we should answer. So far, we're good. We're good. Okay. All right. Great, thanks Catherine for that fantastic overview. Um, I always learn a little bit more when I, when I hear the information that you share out to the world. So um, here is a Riveting photo of myself, Catherine, and a couple other members of the LW Tech team, uh, Michelle and Sue, who both work in the library. And this is during one of our Open for Learning events, which is kind of our inclusive and um, hyper-localized um, take on open education. It's how we, we've branded our open education initiatives at Lake Washington. So just a quick brief history of open at LW Tech. Before 2019, we had a lot of open education work that was happening, but it was happening in pockets. We ended up receiving and achieving the dream grant to work with Lumen Learning. Um, and that went up until 2019, but really before those several years, um, the 2016 to 2019 years, um, OER development and open pedagogy was, it was really in the, uh, the primordial stages. We had a lot of folks that were working with a website called OpenStax to um, create and remix the textbooks that have been published there. We had other textbooks that were being written and created at very low cost um, through other areas of the college that were entirely self-published. And we had uh, an in interesting use of Flickr and other um, open heavy resources for our design and art programs. Those are a few of the examples. There were others as well, but those are some of the main ones. It was really messy and um, achieving the dream really helped solidify that brand, that local culture. We, were, we, the librarians, were really interested in exploring that open pedagogy piece that Catherine dove into a few minutes ago. And we did this by way of an assessment in action uh, project. So this project was, was supported by the Library Leadership Council of Washington State. And they were interested in a variety of topics, including OER. And that's where we, we look to get uh, funding 
to start examining how we were teaching with these open educational resources and how effective we were at, at not only using OER, but also exploring open pedagogy. And this was also, of course, in light of the, um, the ramping up into the equity, diversity, and inclusion work that started happening around 2016, 2017 on campus as well. I know some of you might be in uh, schools where that, that work has been accelerating, especially over the last couple of months. But for us, this has been a journey that started back around 2016 um, with the, the creation of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council. So I personally look at open pedagogy as an equity conversation as well. Um, and I think the, there was alignment there with that AIA uh, grant. Since then, we have been exploring open pedagogy and look, looking at open pedagogy through um, institutional research and, as Catherine explained at the very beginning, through a lot of the student-driven research that's been going on on campus and how uh, the work that is being created by students not only for their personal academic gains, but also the community of the school at large um, connects with open pedagogy. And that's really where we are at this point. We're trying to tie everything together and ensure that open pedagogy and open practices um, with educators and students alike is more ubiquitous and more holistic at the college. So to kind of go down and, and focus in on some examples of how open pedagogy actually looks. So this is the, the real world cases of how it's going on at our college. I wanted to dive into um, four of the most, in my opinion, impressive examples of formalized open pedagogy. The first is through the calculus um, course that is run here every year. And it's a business calculus course that is run by math faculty. And in this case, the students are asked to study a business local or regional um, in terms of the Pacific Northwest, one that is uh, well known. So it could be Amazon, it could be Starbucks, or it could be something slightly smaller in scale. Um, and they're supposed to do a research paper and presentation. Where we started in integrating open pedagogy is this idea of creating the renewable assignment. So instead of only creating a research paper that gets submitted to the professor or um, maybe gets submitted to a discussion board in Canvas, we decided that we wanted to do something more. The intention is that this research is going to be improved upon and or responded to on an annual basis. So those student projects use public domain data so business data that is published online and free, freely available to anyone. And that work is um, uh, created uh, using a format that can then be looked at and reviewed by students that take the course uh, the following year. In terms of the biology presentations piece, um, this has been one of the, the more challenging uh, open pedagogy projects. Um, at its core, we intended it to be quite simple, but we've run into a lot of issues, um, some that Catherine actually mentioned in terms of the inequities that, that pervade our, our world here. Um, but the basic assignment, the gist of the assignment is that students will do presentations on topics within their biology course, and those presentations will go into a YouTube channel or other platform for sharing and supporting student learning. And biology is a course that runs almost every quarter. Um, so this, in theory, is a pretty straightforward renewable assignment. Um, where we've run into some issues is the professionalism piece, the public speaking piece, and the recording environment piece. So the librarians have had to play a pretty pivotal role in intermediation regarding providing the technology and the, the training and essentially the recording for these students, um, which is a bandwidth problem and a capacity problem. And we're still trying to work our way through this, but we are holding strong and continuing to work with these biology professors uh, in terms of getting these students um, proper recording environments and um, their presentations properly recorded. 
the sociology game and glossary has been one of our flagship uh, examples of open pedagogy. And I want to pause and say that all of these are linked on the link below if you're interested in exploring them further. The sociology game and glossary have been years in the making. They've been successful for years. They started with this idea uh, that we wanted to bring more gamification into information literacy instruction from the library point of view. And we worked with uh, one of the primary pr professors in social science to get uh, their sociology course gamified. And uh, with the help of Catherine, I uh, created a game that was similar to Cards Against Humanity and Apples to Apples, simple card game that pairs concepts with scenarios. And we took the principles of open pedagogy to bring student experience and student voice into the actual creation of the cards. So over the course of several years, we have um, develop the core game with student feedback in terms of the actual game mechanics and an emphasis on refining those mechanics. And we've also continued to emphasize the importance of every individual student's identity or identities and their lived experiences um, by way of expansion packs. So not only are students creating um, cards for the generic decks, but they're also now voting on timely topics that then uh, create the core for the expansion packs that go into this, this ongoing game project. Pretty exciting stuff. In terms of the glossary, it's similar. We have a Canvas glossary that is growing every quarter. Um, it's openly licensed, meaning it's uh, available to anyone that wants, wants to use it and see it. Um, the students are contributing entries for all of the different topics based on their own, again, lived experiences, and they can choose the medium by which they share definitions for these vocabulary terms. That could be everything from a definition in a student's own words to um, a phot photograph or a selfie or a poem and so on and so forth. And Thank you for the question um, regarding uh, Anne's question, if it was online or physical. I actually have provided an explanation in um, one of the links inside that link list on this slide, but the short of it is we started with entirely physical and I was literally creating all the physical games it was kind of agonizing, but uh, we've converted it into an online discussion board form of gameplay where the students um, are actually responding to um, all of the cards that get generated in this matchmaking um, topic generation. It's pretty exciting because it shows that the, there is a certain versatility in the content that's being created in that reusability in different spaces. So we've successfully converted the original game into a discussion board format. Um, finally, and I know I'm kind of dragging on here a little bit, so I want to move forward. Um, the dental hygiene piece, we've actually started breaking into our health programs, which have been a uh, hard nut to crack because of so much um, proprietary information and technology in our health programs. Um, but we've started really bringing in open pedagogy into uh, the dental hygiene program by way of student presentations, and they've actually started using Zoom, if you can believe it or not, in our social distancing um, in, uh, to environment to create presentations that are actually uniform in nature. Um, the hardest part now has been to make sure that all of the content that students use in their presentations is openly licensed, otherwise it will no longer be an open educational resource, but we have challenged some students and our dental hygiene students have uh, enjoyed the challenge to try to create an, an openly licensed or openly licensable presentation using Zoom. And uh, we've also started doing some um, open uh, videos with uh, faculty. I was just doing a radiograph presentation with one faculty that will then be, it's already on YouTube, it's already got an open license and that will be used in her classes this quarter. So we're making um, some headway in terms of our health programs. 
And I just want to just emphasize that all of this is starting in the classroom. It's getting students into the expectation that they're contributing to their future, their future cohorts and the future peers um, learning. And it's also available um, in multiple spaces online for the public to use. So when we think about research and this intersection between open education and undergraduate research, we also have been doing a lot in terms of student publication and student creativity at L LW Tech that is setting a precedent for this conversation. Um, I realize there's some internal links here, so hopefully we'll be able to link to uh, a hosted version of the slides after the presentation is over. Um, we have a Lions Pride student publication, which has been going since around 2015, give or take, um, and that is online as well. We have student expos and symposia because a lot of our students are um, doing applied learning and applied research here at the college. Um, we have everything from design and portfolio events to capstone and other symposia that happen in person and online and that's showcasing and emphasizing student work. Obviously there's independent research and project-based learning that's happening at all colleges and universities around the world. We are um, of no exception or exclusion to that. We see a lot of courses that are um, that are bound to faculty interests regarding research. And a lot of the research that has happened here has been um, driven by a specific faculty and the professor's um, uh, personal interests and their own goals in terms of getting their work published with the support of their students. And for the first time ever this year, uh, last quarter, we had an annual applied research symposium which was a wild success, had dozens upon dozens of attendees, um, had uh, around a dozen student presenters, uh, student groups, I should say, um, that shared their work. And that in many ways is, again, showing the imperative to think about where all of this publication is happening, where all of this creativity is happening, and where there's room for open education and open licenses to, to connect to this work. In terms of some of the broader level conversations, I like to think about research as a spectrum. Those examples already pretty much show that spectrum, but the questions are really interesting to ponder. So in terms of this spectrum, how do we each define research within higher ed? Our background in terms of open education leans towards the lack of a specific definition, right? We want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to define research in their own context. And administration has certain goals, um, individual faculty have certain goals, students have certain goals and expectations when they enter a space of higher learning. Um, especially when it comes to bachelor degrees and higher, there may be decisions that students make based on the research that's happening. But I would argue that those decisions are, are happening even um, at the community and technical college level. The spectrum could include research done within a an individual or a given course, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we have certain math courses, for example, and science courses where the professors are um, their goal is to take students to conferences and get students experience um, sho showcasing research that's being done so that they can succeed as they go on, transfer to another college or get a higher degree somewhere else. So that's happening on an individual course level. College events are another opportunity to explore where research is happening. And as I already indicated with that annual symposium, there is this unification in terms of our shared understanding and shared identity where research is happening. But then there's also student interest. We've had a lot of students that have gone above and beyond when it comes to researching specific topics and looking to make great change with their efforts uh, outside of courses, outside of formal spaces. To give one example, we had a student who was so interested in mental illness and art that they created a um, art therapy program 
as a club, it was in the form of a club uh, at the college, and that's continuing to go to this day. Research was put into that work, into that output. So we can see that, that, that when you think about research, when we each think about research, we can look at the perspectives and the interests or needs for our individual community members within our individual institutions as, <clears throat> excuse me, as a starting space for defining and looking at how to talk about research. So some additional questions. I'm a questions person, so I like to ask questions as a way to get the gears spinning and, and thinking about where we can go from here. Um, where does open pedagogy meet research? How to tie all of this together? We have uh, students who are creating productive work. So how can we connect the productive work of our students, whether it's in a course, whether it's for a specific program, or whether it's their own individual interests, how can we connect that to open practices? How can we push student research beyond the annual symposium? And where does open and research overlap? Are there appropriate lines to draw? In our abstract, we discussed this in a few different ways. And one of those ways was simply in terms of the way we store and share out the work that's being done. And I think that if we consider the popular and localized media and spaces through which we share information and share the work that's being done, that can also help frame conversations. So that could be sharing presentations on YouTube. It could mean creating an institutional repository and having a library or catalog of student work of all shapes and sizes. That could be even the in-person and synchronous or digital and, synchro and synchronous um, experiences. Or it could be, as we're going to explore in a few minutes, um, Canvas Commons or the plethora of websites that exist out there that are designed to showcase the work of our students and ourselves. So organizing in the open storage and access, some of these examples kind of uh, segueing from what I just was talking about. Um, we've looked at and used individual Canvas courses. So I think one of the things that I've learned from the gazillion webinars and meetings that I've, I've been um, viewing and witnessing over the past four months is that a lot of educators are leaning into what already works and what they're already used to. And Canvas courses for us, or whatever LMS you're using, but for us, Canvas courses is the starting point. Folks are already storing so much in Canvas courses, this might be the most appropriate space to store the work and um, the output of student efforts and educator efforts um, when it comes to that openly licensed material. We also use Canvas Studio, which is similar to Panopto. It's a plugin or extension of Canvas that allows the um, organization of videos and video content within Canvas. So that might be a great way to start sharing different videos. The great thing about Canvas Studio is that it promotes accessibility in ways that some, some platforms don't do so well with. And uh, it also can import from other websites like YouTube. So if you find an openly licensed video or if you start sharing to YouTube, you can easily localize it using Studio. Canvas Commons uh, takes the work that we've been doing and shares it out more broadly. I'm not going to dive into all of the nuances of Commons. I'm sure many of you are already familiar, but um, Commons does allow for sharing on multiple levels, not only for yourself, but your institution, your system, and the overall public. And then, of course, um, we here at LW Tech, as I linked earlier, have an OER Canvas website, but we also have an OER Canvas shell. So we include a Canvas um, course, as it were, that stores and manages all of our OER materials, or most of them. Now, as a librarian, I got to say that storing hundreds of resources in one Canvas course is a bit of a nightmare and antithetical to everything that we do. Uh, it's not very appropriate for searching and browsing. 
Um, but it, it, it works because folks are familiar with it and it allows in a wiki style fashion, um, folks can contribute from a variety of spaces and a variety of roles at the college. Already kind of went into YouTube, but creating a YouTube channel for sharing open content is possible. There's also the Washington Hub at OER Commons that I want to plug, and I'm not sure about Oregon and if there's a similar initiative down there, but um, OER Commons is a website that has a variety of hubs that are uh, filterable or browsable by subject area or by initiative. So this is another great space for um, communities um, within specific institutions to start throwing out, meaning sharing their work that's being done. Um, I wanna take a moment and pause. I do see that there have been some contributions to the chat and I appreciate that. I wanna take maybe five to 10 seconds and ask folks on the, on the um, uh, presentation, what are you using to store your student work? Um, feel free in Zoom to change your, uh, your option to send to all panelists and attendees so that, uh, so that everyone can see. In addition to um, the examples, if you have other examples, throw those in the chat as well. What have you at your school used to store the student work that's being created? Thank you, Ray, for getting us started with Canvas Commons. Fantastic. Open Education Blackboard, okay. Thank you, Cassidy. Okay, well, those contributions are fantastic. Um, if anyone else wants to throw in ideas uh, as to where student work is being um, created or shared, that's awesome. And it's also okay if you don't know. I think that something that I have found over the course of the years that I've been involved, been involved is that a lot of folks are doing work in the open, so to speak, and they're not really familiar with their institution's practices, or maybe the institution doesn't even have practices yet. And that's totally understandable and respectable. Um, if you are one of those folks where you're not quite sure, consider using this as a jumping off point to get that conversation started at your institution. Some of the things that I would consider um, in terms of scaling storage, because we are thinking now at Lake Washington about all of these different things that are happening and how there could be a very, very large incline in the work that's being created. From a librarian standpoint, we need to think about this exponentiality uh, in terms of our management and in terms of our capacity. So if this research and this work grows, especially in terms of the, the overall college conversation, um, how are we going to be able to manage that scale? There is, of course, the institutional repository option, but even with the open source versions or the open source options of IRs, that is costly in terms of time and maintenance. And if you don't have someone that's working at your institution that can support that, whether on IT or in the library or otherwise, that is probably not going to be an option. Um, finding ways to manage many objects in a standardized platform is one of the largest barriers, I think, that I've, I've encountered when thinking about institutional repositories or one common website. Um, even with those hubs or those collective websites, they might not be able to handle specific types of files or specific types of content that's framed in certain ways. Can they host and can they host accessibly, for example, a zip file that contains 2,000 files that make up a, a computer game that a student has created and wants to share with the world? Can those uh, websites host videos in a variety of formats that can reach a variety of audiences, whether they're HD or not HD, whether they have transcripts or not, they, they do not, um, whether they support captioning or not. There's so many different issues that I think we need to consider going forward in terms of scaling storage. Um, and a lot of those also concern time and money, and that all amounts to our budget. 
Um, I say this, <laughs> we were thinking about this presentation before the, the precedence of the pandemic really hit and before our total understanding, which is not total even now, um, of the, the fallout in terms of our budgets uh, really became apparent. So this is going to be even more fascinating and problematic as we go forward because we want to leverage the value of open and we want to support the exponential increase in research, but we need to do so in a way that makes sense in terms of um, what I would argue is no budget um, at this point. And that might mean grants, that might mean external support, or it might mean a, a grassroots effort in terms of how we scale. Thank you, um, Christine, for the openoregon.org shout. All right, Catherine, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, so um, at this point, we'd love to hear from some of our attendees. Um, we've already started the conversation a little bit, but um, we hope that some of you are willing to unmute or write in the chat some of the experiences that you've had with open pedagogy or OER at your institution. Um, are you using OER? And then um, how are students involved in research at your institution? So um, I'll give you a little bit of time. Let's see. Anna says, another open source medium to share content is GitHub. Absolutely. Um, and I just wanted to point out that there are some questions for you as well in the Q&A area. Um, you can choose to address them now or say before later. Just wanted to get your attention on that. Yeah, I think maybe the, the first question that Ray asked, um, are OER materials like OpenStax playing a significant role being used in developing open pedagogies or reusable assignments? And yeah, I think that's an interesting question about um, uh, a lot of the examples that Greg gave were students developing OER. And it's kind of now asking the question, if you are starting with OER, can you then use that to create open pedagogies? So, um, and I think you can. I don't, I don't have any examples of that necessarily, maybe Greg does, but that's kind of the point is that with OER, you can take, with OpenStax, it's a textbook that's a package that's, that's, that you can just use as is, or you can take it and show it to your students and ask them to do something interesting with it. Um, change it so that it's um, more representative of the students in the class somehow, or um, ask them you know, different ways to develop the textbook and make it more relevant to them. Yeah, um, that final piece is really important, Catherine. And some of you who are enthusiasts or practitioners when it comes to open, this might be uh, redundant or this might be something you've heard before, but I want to just emphasize that the remixing and the rewriting, the recreation of these core texts or reliable texts is, is getting a lot of traction, especially in the CTCs, the community and technical colleges, when it comes to student experience and student identity. Um, specifically, we have that sociology course that I already discussed in terms of the game and the glossary. That actually started with an OpenStax book and has since evolved because the professor didn't think that the language and the examples were relevant or specific or inclusive to the students that are taking the course, the sociology course at our college. So some of the common examples in terms of uh, open pedagogy with these resources is assessing them or evaluating them from the perspective of your students. Do they use the language that your students um, would find comfortable and inclusive? Do they have um, represent, do the resources have representation of the identities or identities that your students um, hold or value or embody or have and are those um, representations uh, effective? And um, I think right now we're at a point where the students with open pedagogy 
have the opportunity and have the, are, are being respected um, for their voice and their own experiences and their own perspectives to the point where we can now ask, are these resources, um, do they need to be torn down? Do they represent uh, the oppressor or the dominant perspective? Um, are they uh, causing harm? Are they causing marginalization? Are they causing um, systemic disconnects in terms of the students and their experiences? And is that impeding? And how is that impeding um, the learning and the and the educational ecosystem at large within the institution? And I do I know that through open pedagogy and through a lot of different ways, whether it's or methods, whether it's through revising books or um, all of the other examples that we've provided earlier, um, it's allowing those conversations to happen. All right, so um, Weiwei says that you do now have the ability to unmute if you'd like to share any experiences at your institution with OER or um, emerging student research. If not, we do have a little activity. Yeah. And there is another question from Ray. Um, are any interactive e-learning tools such as H5P being used by students or instructors for reusable assignments? And I'm gonna let Greg take that. Um. Thanks for the question, Ray, on that. Uh, we have not seen H5P being used at, at LW Tech, but uh, I do know that it's being explored at Centralia College, which is also in Washington. Um, and uh, Professor Ryer Banta, who is a faculty librarian there, has been a huge proponent of it. Um, in terms of other tools, I, I think that a lot of the faculty here have been exploring for the first time because of remote learning. They've been exploring for the first time a lot of these uh, digital tools. And so as far as I know, we're at a very early place with them. Um, I know that a lot of them are being used in Zoom environments because they have been really um, helpful and effective in synchronous learning. Um, but it's something that I'm really looking forward to seeing emerge um, going forward. And if anyone out has, has experience with that in terms of open pedagogy, I would love to, to discuss that. I think um, we should probably move on, Catherine. Yeah, I, and I, I wonder if we should even skip our uh, scenarios or, or just go through them quickly. Sure. Yeah. Let's move forward. Um, so uh, we did have a couple of group activities we were originally going to think about doing in breakout rooms, but then um, wanted to do as a as kind of a group discussion piece. So as we go through this, um, please just throw into the chat um, or indicate if you want to speak and interrupt, that's totally fine. But because of our 10 minutes remaining, we're gonna go a little bit quick. The goals of this activity um, and now this kind of lecture it are as follows. To explore two examples of open pedagogy and research in a higher ed setting, to respond to the problem of the disposable assignment, and to creatively think about open licensing, storage, sharing of generated materials, reuse, and student voice. So Catherine, would you like to? Sure, yeah. So the, we had a couple scenarios. Maybe we'll only do one scenario. Um, thinking about a disposable assignment and how we could change it to, um, to be open. So students are asked to conduct, conduct research and write a paper on a historical figure. The figure must be selected from a list provided by the instructor. These papers are written and submitted to the instructor for a grade and the assignment is complete with no additional use of the papers. So then we have questions. Um, so the first one, how will the research be reused? So I think that's the, the most important thing to think about right at the beginning when you're considering um, how, to, how to make a disposable assignment um, more valuable beyond just the student that's working on it. 
Um, question two, how will student voice slash opinion on this assignment be considered? So I think Greg has done a really good job of explaining how important it is to listen to our students and hear what they have to say and think about how the structures of education can be changed to, to really um, consider students. Question three, how will licenses and licensing of student work be included in this assignment? And um, I, I mentioned it once before, but I want to say again, uh, it's possible that students won't be interested in doing an open license for their work and you have to be aware of that possibility and that that is still definitely open pedagogy, even though uh, a student may not want to use a Creative Commons license for their work. Um, and number four, how will the research be stored and or shared? And so I, I think we've done a good job of already starting to um, list different possibilities for how to share out information. And yeah, I, and Greg was saying that that hopefully will grow and um, we'll have more opportunities, more options. So, so this, yeah, you, go ahead. Ahead. you, you, you do, do it. it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so in our first scenario, one approach that we came up with um, was instead of just writing the paper, the students would first be asked to look on Wikipedia for a historic figure that they feel a connection with. So rather than choosing from a list that the, the faculty member provides. Selection should be based on an article that lacks information. So how that's defined would be up to the, the faculty. Could be that the, the article only has a paragraph. Um, and that's all that the, that the world currently knows about that, that person through Wikipedia. Students review other historical figures on Wikipedia that can paint, contain a lot of information in order to see how those articles are structured. Then the paper is written using the structure observed on Wikipedia. So the intent would be to um, not copy the writing of Wikipedia, but copy the structure. So then in addition to submitting the paper, students will have the opportunity to add their writing to the Wikipedia article. So they would create an account with Wikipedia um, and throw in their information that they've found using all of the standard research practices that would otherwise have been taught. And they would review and edit their peers' Wikipedia contributions as well. Um, and that could be a, a looking back and editing the peers Wikipedia contributions from a former iteration of the course. So again, renewable assignments here um, or within the actual course with the intention that their contributions would be reviewed potentially by students going forward. Um, Catherine, I think we do have a couple minutes. We have another question, but uh, to quickly go through the second scenario. Would you like to read it? Sure, yeah. So uh, scenario two, the chemistry experiment. So students are asked to complete a basic chemistry experiment derived from a typical chemistry textbook. The experiment is worked on in class and the worksheet is submitted to the instructor when the experiment is complete. And then we have the same questions about how will the student's work be reused? And how will student voice or opinion on this assignment be considered? How will licenses and licensing of student work be included in this assignment? And finally, how will the student's work be stored and or shared using specific plat tools or platforms? So this is an example that um, it was kind of inspired by BCIT in Vancouver, um, uh, British Columbia Institute of Technology. The fac some of the faculty there are doing something similar. But essentially students would begin with conducting their original experiment. And afterwards they're asked to brainstorm ways that they would tweak the experiment connected to their interests. Um, on their own time, they would conduct the experiment with these modifications and create a video of the process. Um, this could be a video literally done on their phone um, or something a little bit more formal. And then the videos are shared on a YouTube channel for the class. In addition to posting their experiment videos, students would be required to post reaction videos or reaction comments to their peers past and present and otherwise provide comments. Um, and then the uh, opportunity to openly license it as needed um, could be reinforced to allow for these videos to be used in other environments, not just in this one particular assignment 
for this one particular course, but outward um, with other uh, with other courses. Um, if if folks discover and want, if other educators or students discover and want to use this this um, content. So we have about three minutes, so I'll go real quick. And then Catherine, if you want to um, tackle the final questions. Um, in terms of moving towards the future, I think right now we have some imperatives. They're not unfamiliar. Student voice is huge. Student participation is huge. What does that mean during COVID-19? Inequities abound and they have always abound. They've always been abound, but they're now even more visible and present as we go through these drastic shifts in modality, drastic shifts in format and distance um, will further push folks away from us. Digital equity and the remote community, what folks have access to, um, what is accessible, not only in terms of um, accessibility legally and in terms of um, accessibility as we know it um, by way of disability, but also accessibility in terms of what is available by, by way of cost and the digital platforms that are available. So it's a divide issue. Um, involvement and contributions, I think is really important now. Um, thinking about students and thinking about neutrality and where we're directly making um, initiatives to support students rather than being uh, those neutral educators of past generations, I think is really important to reconsider now too. Um, we've also, Catherine and I discussed where there are opportunities now. These are also not unfamiliar. We have the opportunity to collaborate Collaboration between colleges is happening. Where can it happen in terms of open pedagogy? Where can it happen in terms of research? Um, thinking about those costly institutional repositories as one example. Where are there opportunities to revisit open licensing, revisit open culture, and um, how can we evolve our intentions on sharing the work that we're doing? Um, whether it's through Canvas Commons, whether it's through YouTube, whether it's through Wikipedia, um, or all of the countless other um, examples of spaces where work can get shared. All right, Catherine, would you like to tackle any of the comments or questions? Yeah. Wrap up? Sure, yeah, so Kristen had a question. So she says, in my department, we are exploring OpenStax textbooks in biology. The weakest point for these are the images. Are there any renewable assignment repositories for students creating images? Um, yeah, I think that's that's a good question. I, I don't know of any student created repositories. Um, but uh, I was thinking if you if you move forward, Greg, in the in the presentation, we have um, these lists of uh, of possible tools. So um, so Flickr, I think, is the main image one that we have listed here. Pixabay is another really excellent image repository that's, um, with Flickr, you have to be careful to make sure it is openly licensed. Um, with Pixabay, it's a, uh, it, everything is openly licensed. So Pixabay, how it's spelled. Um, and then I would suggest, you know, if you're having issues with images and you don't like what's in the textbook, you can have your students creating images. I think that would be a great way to get them involved and really have them drive their education and take control of what they're learning and um, can be very useful for the rest of the, for future learners. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, I see, Ray, you suggested uh, Google Drive and OneDrive. Um, yeah, repositories like that, I think, are really awesome to consider. Obviously, there's going to always be the, the librarian uh, with the librarian hat on the issue of privacy and security um, and access. Um, how open are they? But as repositories, um, these types of tools could be considered. Dropbox, obviously, is another one. Um, there are a bunch that are available out there. Um, and what's available for free or at low cost. So your institution might have um, options for that as well. And Christine, Wikipedia Commons. Yeah, that's another great option for images. Um, I would also 
suggest thinking about how are the images being used? Are they only being used in terms of repository, um, in terms of a repository, or could you, as an educator, bring them into the assignment? So going back to that Wikipedia assignment regarding um, the, or that Wikipedia example regarding the research paper, you could also find uh, ways to bring in uh, artwork or photography or uh, public domain images into Wikipedia articles that are lacking images. Um, so thinking about how that image-based assignment could have some function and utility to it and, and value in terms of um, what the students are doing with their work, how they're actively contributing. 